it's your show, as I say every time. It is your program. You're not here to listen to me, but you are here to ask, get your views and, of course, the responses from our distinguished panel, which is now properly assembled. So let me, let me introduce them uh, one by one. I'm sure you know them all anyway. Uh, on the left, uh, Steve Williams, Chairman of the Police Federation. Morning. Alongside me, the right honourable Damien Green, Minister of State for Policing. Ari needs no introduction uh, whatsoever. So you, Ord, President of ACPO, uh, and Sean, who is the crime editor of The Times. Um, there's no speeches in this session. We're going to go straight into questions. And I'm going to call on Karen Lee. Can Karen identify herself first of all for me? Well, there she's in the middle. Can we get a, a microphone to Karen? Karen comes from God's own country, Greater Manchester. Uh, and she has this question about what for me has been the most surprising sort of set of facts that emerge in this conference. That's about cybercrime. So, uh, Karen, put your question, please. Morning. Um, my question is, the police service, the government and the media have all been reporting that crime is reducing. We know, and we've talked about it over the last few days, that crime is actually changing, not reducing, particularly around cybercrime, and that's now one of the biggest threats for the police service and the public for the future, especially around volume crime. So I'm asking, do we need a review on crime recording and classifications, and do government ministers have the appetite for this, and what would be the implications politically of the subsequent or any subsequent increase in crime? Well, clearly I'll start with the government minister sitting to my left. Uh, what surprised me about this uh, speech from uh, the uh, Deputy Chief Consul of the East Midlands yesterday, uh, Damon, was the revelation, I never knew, that there's more cyber crime than there is conventional crime these days, and yet we're still saying crime is falling. So what's your response to Karen's uh, question? Uh, well, I think there's two really central questions uh, within Karen's question, one of which is about uh, crime rates and the other is about response to cyber crime. So I'll, I'll deal with them in turn. Um, of course crime is changing, crime uh, always change it, is always changing, um, but crime is falling. It is, it is the best bit of measurement that the public sector does, because uh, we don't do it once, we do it twice in two completely separate ways through uh, the ONS, uh, through, uh, through the, uh, the police crime figures uh, and through the British Crime Survey, and consistently uh, over years uh, it's shown uh, that crime is coming down, um, and uh, I think uh, through the years where crime was consistently going up uh, on both measures, uh, nobody questioned those yeah, measures. But cybercrime is crime, and you can't be expected to include in your figures crimes you don't know anything about. But that's the problem. A lot of it simply goes unreported. And another revelation from that uh, speech yesterday was that of something like 3,000 crimes, cybercrimes, less than 100 had actually been investigated. So that does imply, to suggest that these figures are slightly misleading. That, that, that's a different issue, because one of the things we've done, because, because quite right, cybercrime uh, needs to be recorded as well, um, and that's why uh, we've set up uh, Action Fraud, uh, specifically to make sure that we uh, record cybercrime better, and indeed, that's showing an increase. That's one of the areas of crime that is showing an increase, and that, that reflects the reality, uh, I'm sure. Um, in terms of what we do about it, because, because you're right, uh, not enough of those crimes are investigated, and, and that's something for each force to look at, because the, the packages they get from uh, action fraud um, have been triaged. They're, they're not just a raw piece of, of intelligence about a crime. You know, they, those are crimes that should be investigated. So that's for individual forces to do. But also, we are actually shifting resources into uh, cybercrime. The, the National Cyber Security Programme uh, is 650 million uh, additional pounds of investment uh, up to 2014, of which the Home Office gets about 10%. Um, and we've prioritised the National Cybercrime Unit to make sure we can deal with it at a national level, uh, and also strengthening the regional uh, police uh, capability through dedicated uh, regional capabilities, and as I say, through much better uh, recording. So we do have the appetite to deal with this. Okay, uh, Steve, do you think we need to review the way in which we record crime and, and the impression we give the public about, is, I mean, is crime falling or is crime simply changing? No. And, and do we need to change the the way in which we present it to the public in view of what we now know. Yeah, I mean, the face, the face of crime is actually changing. Uh, the way we currently, I, I agree with the Minister, the, the way that we currently record crime is clearly down, but I think the reality of the situation is we haven't got an absolute clue what the extent of the problem is out there in relation to cybercrime, and, and this is at the very heart, I think, of the integrity of the police service. It's something that desperately needs to be addressed, and we want the public to be confident in the crime figures that are produced, and, and I don't believe that currently those crime figures are reflective of what's going on in the country. See you all. Uh, again, I'm full of surprises this morning, but it did shock me uh, when, it, when we were listening to uh, the uh, speech yesterday. Uh, 
to find out the extent to which police are equipped to deal with this. And I think it was generally accepted that if I had uh, suffered a cyber attack and I went to my local police station, the odds are a police officer, an ordinary police officer, for understandable reasons, I'm not being critical, wouldn't have a clue what to do. I'm not sure it's uh, quite that bad. Our Minister's touched on a number of the, the sort of reforms that have taken place in terms of how we do it. Uh, you know, you've got the National Crime Agency is gaining momentum. I met with the Chief only uh, yesterday on their progress. They'll have a role, you know, the regional role has got uh, refined. Um, action fraud led by Adrian Leppard, Chief Constable of uh, the City of London, is doing a huge amount of work, as already identified. So you know, I, do, I, don't, I don't think we need to be too downbeat about it. You're right in terms of the scale. Mm. Um, it is huge, and it's, it's such a broad spectrum hidden under the sort of term uh, cyber crime, which rates from you know, traditional crime being carried out through you know, modern technology right through to uh, intellectual property fraud at the highest level, costing companies billions of pounds, which we probably won't find out. So, about. do we need to review issue. the way we uh, record and classify? Well, I guess it's a slightly different issue. And I've, I, I, the crime record, how we record crime, has always been a bone of contention. It's highly complicated. Um, I remember some of the arguments and some of the issues identified by HMI over many years around the complexity of the system, and we need to make it simpler. I think the challenge is, of course, then you get into all these arguments about are you comparing like with like, how can you actually uh, identify where trends are going. But out with all of that, um, I do think we need to be a bit more uh, positive and recognise that the role the service has played in reducing what we used to call in Northern Ireland ordinary decent crime. Because that actually is a, a sort of irrefutable fact now. It's not just us, it's the British Crime Survey. Uh, it's, all the surveys are going in that uh, direction. And I think you know, the service should take some credit for some of the work it's done around intelligence-led policing, targeting, uh, and the relentless pursuit of those who cause citizens difficulty in the routine of their day, because that has been a huge success story for policing, and we sort Fair of forget enough. that. Sean, I mean, when you write stories, as, you, as you're bound to do, about, about crime falling, uh, are you not unwittingly, but innocently misleading the public? Well, I'm entirely sceptical about crime figures and the way they're collected and, and, and what they reflect. I think Hugh is right. There, there is no doubt that ordinary decent crime has fallen markedly, and you just have to look at the murder rates particularly to see that. But with cybercrime and particularly things like card cloning, I mean, we have a huge issue, not just in the public reporting that to the police and the police investigating it, but authorities like the banks uh, you know, simply do not tell the police about these things. Sure. They solve it themselves. And, and perhaps one of the greatest strides we have taken towards tackling this is almost accidental what's happened just in the last uh, month or so, the move towards licensing of private investigators, because we have tens of thousands of private fraud investigators doing this on, on behalf of the banks and, and on behalf of law firms and, and all the rest of it. And, and they are for they are filling a, a, a sort of capacity gap that the police simply don't do at the moment. It is difficult, Aaron, isn't it? Because, I mean, we heard uh, yesterday that about one company uh, which was under cyber attack on average 24 times a day, people trying to get into their system to steal uh, secrets, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. And that, the owner of that company, which was obviously a significant large company, had never once reported no. this to the police. But, and I think this is a, a gap that's out there in terms of uh, accepting the points being made by Sir Hugh and by the Minister about crime uh, recording and that being reflected in the British Crime Survey or the Crime Survey for England and Wales. The, the issue is that there are members of the public out there who don't realise they've been a victim of crime. They don't regard so, it as a crime so, problem. So they don't even think, when they get asked the question, have you been a victim of crime, they don't yeah. think they have. They don't realise they have. Or they're actually too embarrassed to report, report it. Or there's the commercial confidentiality issues that prevent them from reporting it. So I do think there are crimes out there that aren't even hitting the scale of, on the, um, the crime survey. So should we reclassify uh, and review the way well, we record crime not, to give I'm, people a, a proper impression of what's happening? I'm not sure reclassifying them it will make any difference because a crime's a crime. That A lot of these crimes that are occurring are actually current crimes. The issue is educating people as to what is a crime in the new world. Uh, and, and the point that was made by Peter Goodman yesterday was about investing in prevention. Um, because if we don't, this is going to snowball to such an extent we'll never catch up with it. So Karen, do you want to come back on what's been said? Where is she? Do you want to come back on that, comment on what uh, has been said? Stand up if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the only thing I would like to know is what the appetite is, really, and I don't think I've had an answer to that from the Minister with regards to it, the increase that there would be if we do get the recording right. It is already happening. As I said, I mean, the, the, the advent of Action Forward uh, means that one of the crime sectors that's showing an increase uh, is cybercrime because we are uh, 
recording more of, of, of stuff that's already happening. So absolutely, uh, I'm not just saying we will have an appetite to do it. We have had an appetite to do it. That's been uh, operating. But politically, the, the implications for you, if you did record this with, with the conventional mm. crime figures, would be pretty devastating, wouldn't they? Um, well, I think the public is in intelligent enough um, to realise that if you're, if you're adding a new figure, uh, then, uh, then that's what you're doing, uh, that, that you know, you're doing the figures as, as honestly um, as possible. Um, but also, um, it's not just a one-way street. I think one of the interesting things that, you know, that, that's going to happen over the next few months is a much greater uh, public education uh, program. And I think that's really important because, funny enough, one of the things that we're all particularly concerned about are elderly people being scammed on the net. And it's relatively easy to educate people. You know, off the top of your head, one could think of phrases like, if this is too good, if it looks too good yeah. to be true, yeah. it's too good to be true. Don't do it. Don't give your bank details what, what about to someone the other thing you don't came, know. What about the other thing that came yesterday? Because, because uh, Mr. Goodman uh, used a cracking analogy for me. He said, you know, when, when people buy computers, you know, they buy them without any kind of protection against this kind of attack. Now, you wouldn't go and buy a car without wheels, so why should you buy a computer with a, with, without some kind of protection against this, this kind of attack? Is there anything you can do in terms of legislation to ensure that those who actually sell the, this equipment uh, en ensure that people have that protection? Uh, well, we're, we're on, in, in another uh, area, uh, we are ensuring that by this Christmas, uh, everyone who buys a new computer for the home uh, will have safety filters automatically on, so you can't accidentally uh, find yourself uh, on uh, fairly disgusting sites uh, without having uh, enabled them, so you can do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not clear how you pass legislation to stop people oh, answering well. emails, which is what, you know, in many cases is you, no, get, sure, you get right. an email out of the blue, yeah. it's, but it's a question of, of educating people so they don't do self-destructive things online. Does it, I mean, does the extent of cybercrime frighten you a bit? I mean, given the, the nature of it, that it's, it's worldwide, it's operated by shady figures, and in some cases, those operating these scams are effectively protected by the governments uh, the, of the countries in which they live. Well, some are, but I mean, there are international conventions, because obviously all over the world, people are responding to this, and the Budapest Convention that we're signed up to uh, means that you do have uh, access to uh, legal redress uh, around the world. I think a lot of it is something, something Sean mentioned uh, about making sure that particularly financial institutions act sensibly, take their share uh, of the responsibility, uh, that uh, they are in a very powerful position because even now people tend to trust their bank uh, and if the bank educates them and treats yeah. them well, then that actually is a very effective line of protection. Okay, I'm going to move on, call on Jim Saunders. Could Jim uh, identify himself? Jim uh, is from Bedfordshire. Is Jim in the hall? There he is. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and could you pose your, your questions about the morale of the police force? Do I understand it, Jim? It is, yes. Thank you. Um, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Mac Jackson spoke about the need for us to look down rather than up. And what he was really saying, is we, in his terms, we should be looking after the troops uh, rather than looking up to the bosses. What is the panel's perception of morale in the police service, particularly at the constable and sergeant inspector ranks? And what can or should the superintendent ranks be doing about it? Okay, Steve, I'm going to kick off with you. You represent uh, the ranks that were first mentioned there. Uh, what's your perception of morale within the service at the moment? I think uh, that uh, the rank and file have felt particularly uh, aggrieved, really, at the, uh, the cuts that uh, they've faced, not only um, within the comprehensive spending review cuts, but also the, the, what they perceive to be attack on their pay terms and conditions, and in particular their pensions. Uh, and there is a real fear factor currently in relation to the potential of compulsory severance being introduced into the service. And uh, I know from having had conversations with, with, with many of the audience here, it is, it's also a fear factor and it, it is affecting the morale of the superintendent ranks. And that is really a, a game changer for the police service. Okay, let me uh, ask you, Irene, what's your perception of, of the officers you represent in terms of morale? Um, well, the question was particularly about the federated ranks. In terms of the federated ranks, I, I agree with Steve. There's a, there's a strong feeling of people being undervalued. Um, but, but being really stretched, it's, it's what I mentioned yesterday. You know, people are feeling that they can't get time off, that the demand's being made on them. And I'm talking about the federated ranks, not just our, our ranks. Um, people are feeling that they, they really are stretched and they can't work out how they can actually remove any more officers from, from the job that they're doing. Uh, and that does affect people's morale. 
But what, what they have got is that commitment to public service. So what you are seeing is people still coming in day in, day out, uh, and working and doing their best to deliver policing service to the public. Um, so, so whilst morale might be low, I actually think that it, it's still got some way to go before people shut up shop and stop, stop playing ball. Well, there's a suggestion, <coughs> wasn't there, that, uh, from the, the, the survey done by Lord Stevens for the Independent Commission uh, initiated by the Labour Party, the suggestion in that re report that, that uh, low morale means lower performance in many cases. But Are you saying that's not the case? There's, well, the, the, they're, they're coming to work and they're doing a really good job. And performance is, is good in a lot of areas because we've seen crime coming down, although crime is not the only measure of, of effective performance in policing. But I think what's really important is that superintendents, in terms of what we can do, is it's about the, exactly the message that Matt Johnson was, Jackson was giving. And I know a lot of the people in the room will do this. It's about knowing your staff, speaking to your staff, mm -hmm. finding out what their issues are, and making sure that we do what we can to support them. We, we've found from our surveys that our members... Um, are sometimes feeling bullied by their chief officers. What we've got to make sure we don't do is actually <clears throat> pass on any feeling of being bullied to the way in which we interact with, with the federated ranks and the staff that, that we lead. Sean, you've got your ear to your, the ground. It's your job to keep in touch with the uh, police officers of, uh, uh, of all sort of uh, ranks. Uh, what's your understanding of the situation in terms of morale? I think, uh, I think it's blindingly obvious that, that morale is, is very, very low. Um, people are feeling under a huge amount of pressure um, but I don't think it's unique to the police service. I think this is quite common across the public sector and, frankly, in the private sector as well. In my, in my own uh, newsroom, we've, we've lost a, a swathe of reporters in, in, in recent years, and, and the, the, this idea of doing more with less is quite common in, in many, many sectors. I think it really hits cops because, you know, you, you really do have to turn out to life and death situations if you're a police officer, and, and there's kind of no going back, and, and you're kind of vocational calling makes you turn out to that. So I think that needs to be recognised. The whole, I, I was talking to somebody quite senior from the Home Office the other day um, about the numbers issue. And for a long time, I think I agreed with what Nick Herbert used to say, that it's not a numbers game, it's not a numbers game, it's about how you allocate the resources and things like this. Um, but I think there's now a recognition that the numbers are getting to, to a, almost to a tipping point where you can't really go any lower. The, the, there has to be a recognition that morale and numbers are, are at a, a really crunch point and, and we have to stop and think what do, next. Do you accept that to you? Um, I know I like Jackson's statement, I wasn't here to, uh, to hear it, sounds to me like a statement of the blindingly obvious um, and the role of uh, superintendents in particular and of course you know, all leaders in the service is to lead their people, it's what we're paid uh, to do and in my experience when I ran a, a real police force <laughs> unlike my current role, um, you know, they were, superintendents were a critical part of that leadership um, dimension and, and by and large they were outstanding um, at doing it so I don't want to be too uh, downbeat and morale was at an all-time low when I joined in 1977 it hasn't got any higher since um, it was the first thing I was told when I went to my first police station by a van driver I don't know what you're doing joining this job lad the job is and I won't go into the uh, graphic detail but it wasn't and the job today is ten times better than the job was then frankly I would not get into the service now with my qualifications and I suspect I'm not unique in that do you accept that, Steve? I mean, uh, uh, he was, well, he wasn't joking. He was telling the, uh, the truth. There is an element of truth in that, isn't there? That, you know, whenever, whenever you talk to policemen, how's my eyes at an all-time low? It's a, bit of, it's a bit of an overworn cliche, isn't it? Yeah. it? Well, at the end of the day, you know, it's still a fantastic job. And I, I agree with Irene that, you know, people are still coming to the coalface and, and producing the goods. And, uh, you know, long, long may it continue. But uh, there is an issue around morale, and we've got to accept that and try to deal with it. Yeah, uh, OK. So Damien Green, uh, you're the person in the frame, as it were, on this one. Um, again, going back to that uh, report by Lord Stevens, in, in a survey, they, they found that 40, I think it was around 40 or maybe 50% of officers were thinking of leaving, and about 40% of staff uh, were thinking of leaving. I mean, that does sound exceptional, doesn't it? Um, I, I defer to Hugh for his, his memory and experience uh, of, of police morale. It's, it's perfectly clear that we have gone through, we're just coming out of, the most horrible worldwide economic experience we've had since the 1930s. That has a direct effect on private sector companies, on the whole of the public sector, and within that, on the police service. But what about Sean's and point that you're now at tipping point well, within the police I, 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 Yeah, I'll come on to that, because I think actually facts are quite interesting here. Particularly, the, it was a University of West, it wasn't John Stevens, it was a different survey uh, that said that 50% okay. of Avon and Somerset mm. uh, were planning to leave. And Avon and Somerset, uh, advertised for uh, 
uh, new jobs because they're actually recruiting. And they advertised 35 positions and received 4,000 applications. So out there, the public thinks rightly that this job is important uh, and they still want to do it. But well, in there, um, there are people saying this is hell. Yeah, sure. Um, and, and it has been really difficult. I'm not, I don't underplay that at all. You know, we, we have had to do difficult things on pay and pensions uh, which have caused uh, a lot of, 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 of anguish. We know that. It was necessary. Yeah, the, the country was broke. We had to uh, do things about it. And, and everyone across the public and private sector um, has, you know, has gone through tough times. We know that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm glad we're now uh, coming out of it. In terms of have we reached a tipping point uh, of numbers, again, it's important to put it in perspective. Even at the end of this period, uh, we will have roughly the same number of police officers as we did uh, in the middle years of the last decade. That th this is not some kind of unprecedentedly low uh, numbers. And uh, the point Nick Herbert, indeed, uh, the Home Secretary, has made throughout that, that in terms of effectively serving the public, a lot of this is about uh, how you use the resources you've got, um, is absolutely right. And on top of that, when you're making savings, then actually, uh, one of the things that's happened brilliantly over the past few years is that people have found ways of doing things more efficiently in back offices so and through collaboration and so on, which will meet, which means that we can uh, keep the resources as far as possible on the front line where we all want them. Do you accept that, Aaron? Well, there are, there are a couple of issues there. One in terms of comparing the numbers uh, today with the numbers back in the mid-90s. The policing world is a very different world than it was in the uh, 1990s. We weren't actively dealing then with child sex exploitation. We weren't actively dealing with a lot of the protecting vulnerable people work that we now do. We didn't have the serious and organised crime uh, levels in terms of resources that, uh, that we have now. We weren't dealing with uh, cybercrime back in the 90s. And what we didn't have then was the extensive neighbourhood policing model that has been really effective over the last eight to 10 years. So actually policing is very different. And just to compare numbers with numbers, I don't, I don't think it's particularly helpful. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday, I, I have real concerns about the extent of savings that can be achieved from further collaboration uh, or from outsourcing or, or the use of technology, which obviously requires an initial investment. I, I have real fear that actually the numbers are going to keep going down for some time. Yet. And that will further impact on morale? Absolutely, it's got to do. Pe people, people are telling me now, and, and it applies to our members as well, that numbers are so low, they can't take time off. They desperately need the work in long hours, they desperately need a day off, but there is just not enough cover for them to actually take a day off. I mean, you're right in saying, uh, Damien Green, aren't you, that you know, every sort of uh, section of the, of the public sector has, has suffered to some extent. But the argument I've heard at many police conferences like this is that they've suffered more than most. Um, in, in numerical terms, that's, that's, that's not the case. Um, in terms of, of what you know, really, uh, I think, has, has, has caused the anguish, the, the, the pay and pensions thing, uh, that the, the, you know, the pay and pensions deal uh, on offer to police officers is still better, in some cases considerably better, than is available throughout the rest of the public sector, and so it should be. You know, they are doing a, a dangerous job as well as a difficult job. So that's, that's where we're going to pitch it. Jim, do you want to come big, back in on this? Any comments on what's been said or further questions? Yeah, I acknowledge the comments that everyone's made. Um, from my point of view, I think the police service has been incredibly resilient. Um, the constables and sergeants, inspectors I'm particularly uh, thinking about, having been spent the last weekend going into a number of briefings with these officers and hearing it from their perspective. And, um, you know, th they've done everything we could possibly ask of them. I think my, my issue and concern is that there is a hidden cost to all this. Yes, performance is good. Yes, we've saved all this money. But at, at that level, uh, they are really feeling the pain. And it's around that cancellation of rest days, that continuous uh, drain uh, on them. And, and, and it's just, it's back to this issue of tipping point. You know, what is that tipping point? And have we reached it? And for myself, I'm a very small force. I think we, we, we are in that position right now. Anyone else want to comment on this subject? Anyone, not, not, you don't have to have uh, written a question to, to take part in this debate. Anyone else hand up who wants to comment on this subject as it's going on? Okay, Damien, just a quick response to uh, Jim's point there, and then we'll move on. What about the tipping points? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it is still, as, as it always is, uh, a question uh, of organising resources, and part of that is about uh, making sure that, that people sort of coming to work refreshed when they do and, and, and don't feel uh, exhausted doing it. And, and the other th thing we haven't discussed uh, in relation to 
uh, changing policing is uh, the use of technology, which I'm really interested in as a way of uh, making sure that it, when people are at work, they are working in ways that they're not wasting huge amounts of time uh, doing things that do depress them and which they feel you know, as a, as, is just not sensible. I think that's, that's one of the things there where, frankly, we've only scratched the surface now. I don't think we're reaching the end of that procedure. I think we're right at the beginning of a procedure of using technology what, better. What's, I'm going to bring to your order in just a moment. What's your response to the, the revelation, and I can't, I can't remember which, which survey or report it was from, which suggested that less than 1% of police officers in this country think that your government, the coalition government, values them? Uh, that, that was the, it was 5%, and that was, that was the Labour Party survey, so I'm entitled, I think, to take that with just a hint of, uh, of salt. But it was, as I say, it's, we've, we've gone through terrible uh, economic mm -hmm. times where we've had to take uh, tough decisions, and, and people have gone through tough times. So the fact that, that people aren't you know, dancing in the streets is, is, is not surprising, mm -hmm. but it, it had to be it's done. It's a staggering and low it figure, though, isn't it? It's um, whatever it is, 0.1 or now oh, 5 percent. It's a staggeringly low figure of people who, you know, are dedicated to public service, and uh, you know, to, to, for them to take the view, you don't value what they do, and it's such an important job they do. 95 percent of them. All I can say is, ab absolutely, I do. The Home Secretary does. The the, 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 the government does. We, we all know, and we all recognise from, from you know, in my case, talking to lots of police officers all the time at, at, at all levels of the service, that they are doing uh, a, a difficult job uh, very well. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that from the figures out there, that there are many, many people in this country who still aspire to join the police service. And, and that, I find, in these very difficult times, hugely encouraging. So you? Um, yeah, I, I, the point I was just going to make, it's interesting, the question came from uh, one of the smaller forces. Um, and if I was to ask any of the sponsors in this room, and I've asked many of the big businesses, if they were faced with 20% cuts, what would you do first? The first thing they'd do is reorganise a business. And we haven't been able to do that because the last government and this government do not agree that one needs a fundamental review of the structure of policing to deal with 21st century threats. And I think that is an impediment on how one becomes more efficient looking forward. Um, <laughs> Because a lot of the, uh, of the real effort put in to, to make the cuts, and it is absolutely right, this government has acknowledged the effort of the service in delivering and getting on with that, is getting more difficult. And if one looks at collaboration, which is going on, it is suboptimal by definition, it is imprecise, and it's a function of so many different factors. What we're seeing is almost sort of different initiatives, huge efforts going in around the country at a regional level to try and drive these changes, but in a, not in a nationally organized way. Um, it is, it's worth just reflecting that in the last review was 62, the last century, uh, and in that review, Royal Commission, and I don't think you need a Royal Commission to resolve this issue, um, they talked about a, a creating a, a service fit for purpose in the next few decades, quote, not the next 100 years. Colour television didn't exist uh, in 1962. The internet wasn't even an idea in 1962. We're talking about national threats, and we're trying to deal with them with a very out-of-date policing model. Um, it is a case of almost ACPO voting, turkeys voting for Christmas because you would see a far smaller management staff. But with whatever number of forces a review came up with, I don't think the answer would be 44. I also don't think it would be one, and I think that's right too. Sure. I do think we need an independent review. Sure. Uh, I just, uh, I completely agree with you on this. You know, I've been doing this job sort of looking from, from the outside into policing now for about five years, and it seems staggeringly obvious that the structure is completely broken, it's not fit for purpose, and we're stretching people, you know, in, in little forces like Bedfordshire, it just doesn't make any sense, you know, crime is, doesn't exist just in Bedfordshire, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's uh, across country, it's across, it, it's international, it crosses borders all over the place, and we don't, as long as we try and stick to this little cat badge idea of Shire County forces, it's just bonkers, isn't it? We're going to pursue that a little bit later on because there's a question, I think, directly on that subject. But uh, thanks very much indeed uh, for your contribution, uh, Jim. I'm going to call on Nikki Ross now. Where is Nikki? Thank you very much. Get a microphone to Nikki. Nikki's from Thames Valley Police. And her uh, question is about the vexed question of direct entry. Hello. I'd, I'd like to ask what it is that the government is seeking to address with direct entry that the service couldn't address itself. 
And perhaps more importantly, why is it so unwilling to listen to the experts who are saying how detrimental it could be in terms of public safety when operational commanders are not able to manage threat, risk and harm? Okay, let me kick off with Damien Green on that. Uh, well, the, any modern service, any modern industry should try to attract talent uh, where it's available from everywhere. And, and as I've said, uh, at all levels, uh, joining the police is still, uh, thankfully, uh, a very attractive uh, proposition. And what we want uh, is to bring in uh, the most talented people, some of whom uh, may be in mid-career uh, and may have other skills to bring. It's, it's quite unusual to have a profession now where it's impossible to think you can reach the top unless you've started right at, at one level and spent decades doing it. That, that's not a very modern way. So what we're trying to do, the, you know, the problem we're trying to address is that the police service recruitment um, is still uh, in a model that's not fit for the 21st century and that if there are people out there who have skills and capabilities uh, to bring in to the police, they should be uh, allowed to do so at a level that they, you know, they, they would want to do because of where, where they've reached uh, in their career. And that in doing that, uh, we will actually bring ideas and ways of operating and ways of looking at the world um, that would be different from uh, the ones that are already inside the service. And that kind of uh, diversity is good just as much as, as you know, when we traditionally talk about diversity. I'm going to be talking about this in a speech later, so I, I don't want to say too much about it now. We all agree, and you know, Irene makes very good points about the need for the service to be more diverse. Well, that diversity needn't be just about uh, more women, more people from ethnic minorities. It should be about more people from different backgrounds coming in at different levels. So that's what we're trying to address. What's wrong with that, Irene? Well, it doesn't take into account the... Um the level of risk that's attached to bringing somebody in at a senior level in an operational environment. The, the, there was a discussion yesterday, I can't remember which part of the, uh, the day it was in, about the fact that we all accept that there are people out there that could bring in great ideas, that could bring in managerial leadership skills to the service at an equivalent level of superintendent rank. The issue is the operational command. The issue is somebody with 15 months experience of policing, and that will include from, from sort of understanding the role of constable right through to being a senior leader in the service, and then taking a firearms course or a senior strategic um, public order commander's course, and going out and into an environment where they're making life or death decisions. When our members do that, and bearing in mind these are pass-fail courses and it's about a 10% fail rate on these courses, when our, when our members do that, they do it based on the 20 years or whatever they've got of, of experience that actually assists their judgment. Yes, they have a tactical advisor with them. That tactical advisor is there to advise. The accountability sits with the person making the decision. And if the per person making the decision hasn't got that experience, you end up with potentially a tactical advisor making operational decisions. Steve? I couldn't agree with Irene uh, more. I mean, the Police Federation of England and Wales are, are, are vehemently against uh, direct entry. Uh, the Minister talks about attracting talent. I think, first and foremost, we should look at the wealth of talent that we currently have in the service before uh, seeking people to come in from outside. And it is a very dangerous place operationally, as Eileen has already made mention of. You have to have that operational background and understanding of what the job entails and the difficulties and threats that operational superintendents face on a daily basis, and it's a dangerous place to take us to. Well, let me ask uh, the Minister to respond to that particular issue uh, before I move on. Well, obviously, you, you need uh, proper training and in the way that is given in uh, other areas, uh, not just the public sector, but you know, the, the obvious uh, analogy here, that there are no close analogies, but I suppose the nearest analogy uh, are military officers, uh, where uh, you can train people uh, to do that, to, you know, to operate in, in extremely uh, dangerous situations. So uh, I don't think it's the case that you have to have done a job at every level to do a job at a managerial level. If you've got the competence and capability to do it, and if you have the capacity to uh, absorb the training, that, that is just what happens in uh, other walks of life. But would the, do you think the public would have confidence in, in the knowledge that 
a man who spent his life working for Marks and Spencers, is suddenly out there uh, in a public uh, disorder uh, situation and directing his troops, uh, police officers, uh, as, as to how to quell it. Well, if they can do the job, uh, then then the public will have confidence in them. I mean, it's it's as simple as that. That's, maybe that's, that's we may true. not find out until in, it's too late. In, in any situation. And I think to say, you know, you, you can't make any change because any change will involve something new happening uh, is a way of ossifying the police service so it never changes at all. And, and you know, we all agree that the world is changing so much that the police service has to change as well. Well, I mean, that, you know, a, a lot of people, I suspect, would, would agree with the, the minister there, uh, Irene. You say, you know, why have you got such a closed mind about, about fresh minds coming in, about someone taking a fresh look at your service, and perhaps making life a lot better for most of you, in, in certain respects anyway. And, and we're not close to that at all. In fact, uh, one of the things we've been advocating, and it's been mentioned again over the last two days, is, is about finding a way of creating opportunities for people like mm. our members to go out into other organisations and to bring learning from them back into the service. That doesn't carry the operational risk that, uh, that the current proposals carry. And I just want to comment on the analogy with the military because obviously um, we had Lieutenant Colonel Matt Jackson with us yesterday. Matt is the equivalent rank to the most of the people here in this room. He, he talks about the successful direct entry program that they have in the military, which is at a much junior level. And when asked the direct question, can you imagine somebody coming in at your level, he was absolutely aghast. He said, under no circumstances. Um, so, so the analogy with the military, I don't think is helpful in these circumstances because we're talking about something very different. Well, Sean, what's your independent take on this? Uh, I think Damien would be probably be surprised to hear me say this, but I completely agree with him. I think policing is too introspective, it's reactionary, it's self-righteous, it has an awful lot to learn from the outside world, particularly the private sector. So I, I'm, I'm in favour of, of direct entry and, and different types of recruitment. I think it's a very good idea. I'm really not sure about the military because I think the military has an aversion to transparency and scrutiny that, that policing really is alert to. So I'm not sure the military is the best route, but it, generally I think you really do need some fresh blood. Let me go back to Nikki straight away. But, uh, you're too introspective. Have you still got the mic, Nikki? Can you stand up with us for a second? You're too introspective. This, this would be enlightening for all concerned, was the essence of what Sean was saying. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's frankly a little bit insulting, I should imagine, to most of the people in this room who... Um, I've been in the service for 25 years. Um, I did have a life before I joined the service, and I have a life outside of the service, um, and I see a lot of other things as well. Um, I mean, we rehearsed this uh, yesterday, so without repeating what other people said, but there are lots of ways to bring that outward-looking view into the organisation without actually damaging the operational command level. But in saying no to uh, direct entry at superintendent level, aren't you opening yourself to the accusation that you're operating a closed shop? No, I don't think so, because like I said, there are opportunities for people to arrive into the organisation. There's police staff roles, uh, and they do a, a wide variety of roles within us. We're, we're not a close-knit organisation that only operates with police officers. And they're really significant in terms of command teams. They're police staff significant roles, but they do what they say on the tin. Um, you know, they come from other organisations. They come from other businesses with their skills. I wouldn't seek to be the head of HR. I don't have that expertise. OK. Uh, let me just repeat, if anyone else wants to come in on these subjects, I've got a hand up down here. And I'm going to see you all first, and then to our friend uh, on the front here, the lady on the front. Yes, you. I think I'm, I just take a bit of issue with uh, Sean. On. I think the service has an awful lot to learn um, from the private sector, an awful lot to learn on how not to do business. Um, you know, if one looks at the, you know, the, the, the crisis we've referred to that led to the 20% cuts in policing, it wasn't brought about by the public sector, it was brought about by appalling leadership and practice in the private banking sector. So I do think there's a, is just a bit of a pushback on that, but it is very easy for the service to come across as defensive on this. Uh, and Tom Windsor's reforms at the lower level, the, which is called direct entry ad inspector, uh, to inspector, is of course not quite accurate. It is in essence a, a, an accelerated promotion scheme to identify the best talent from within and indeed from without through graduate entry, which, which we fully support. And it does show that, you know, we how you broaden the talent pool at that level, which in a way is quite similar to the military model. That is, getting people in at a, at a lower level, um, properly supported, and then progressing them through the ranks and giving them access to better opportunities to get them up there more quickly, but balanced by the more traditional routes that give that sort of critical balance for the service between you know, forward-thinking, very bright, innovative players and those who have the experience to, to complement that in terms of dealing with very difficult 
uh, and challenging operational situations. I mean, the, the, frankly, the view of chiefs on superintendent direct entry is mixed. I think so. it, it is, of course, as Tom quite rightly pointed out, it would be a matter for chief constables, the employment of uh, people at that level. Um, I think some chiefs will, uh, some of the larger forces will see opportunities in that which they can manage the risk on because they're big enough to cope. It's back to, in a way, it's another logical argument for uh, a small number of larger forces would allow that sort of innovation um, to take place. Um, so I don't think a service is ossified. I do think we need to think sort of more openly about it, but balance that and, and look at how we can do that in a managed way. But I do think some chiefs um, will give it a go. Uh, in my previous life, frankly, it would be difficult to imagine how I could confidently put a direct entry superintendent into some of the situations you've seen recently in Northern Ireland without, you know, with a confidence that I could actually protect citizens and be held to account and, exp and justify that sort of deployment uh, if something went wrong. And sadly, in the, in the world we live in, when things go wrong, the inquiries are pretty unforgiving on these, and I can just imagine how they would play. So whilst, you know, it, we mustn't sound offensive, we need to be thoughtful about how we do it. I think it'll be a, a slow process. I do think you will see some direct entry at superintendent. Of course, Tom also recommended direct entry uh, at chief constable level, which is, of course, completely ridiculous. <laughs> Lady on the front, would you mind standing up so the camera can catch him? Thank Tell you. us who you are, thank you. Uh, Joanna Young, Metropolitan Police. First of all, in the Met, we have just had in two people from outside onto management board who are superb, but they've not come in as police officers, and they have brought new insight, new ideas, and they're brilliant. Um, but I can do, I've got a first aid certificate. I'm really handy at DIY. I have a steady hand. You won't make me a surgeon. I know a lot of the law, but I can't be suddenly become a barrister overnight. And equally, I'm pretty good at maths, but I can't go and be an accountant. They are all professions. They do not have direct entry. I just don't understand what makes anybody think someone can come in at such a senior level and just take over with 15 months training. You want to professionalise us, and so do I, but then we become away from a profession if we simply allow our profession to be able to have this direct entry. It doesn't make sense and it doesn't add up. Damon Green? Um, it, it, it's factually not true. Actually, in less than 15 months, you can become a barrister. Uh, you, you, know, you can do a pupillage in six months and be taken on. So, yeah, Would some, you get much work, some, though? Some professions... Well, it depends what you come in. I, yeah. I, 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 I have barristers in my family, and I know that actually that's a profession where increasingly, for all the difficult... You know, if, if, if you think police morale is low, you should talk to barristers at the moment. They're miserable as well. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the, uh, uh, they have quite a lot of people who, uh, in mid-career, think this is something I want to do. Uh, and they, often they have very high academic qualifications which don't have any direct relevance. They may not have law degrees and things like that. Uh, and they come in and they have the talent uh, to get work. So I think you know, other professions do this sort of thing. But what, what I want to say is... is, is put well, other professions don't necessarily involve the participants involved in, involved in, in public order disturbances, etc., etc., uh, and protecting the public from gangsters, from hoodlums, from drunks. You know, it's a different and, world. And, and I, I was, that, that's why I want to, to put this, this debate in, in perspective, which is it's to pick up a point that Hugh made, that in five years' time the percentage of the police service that would have come in through direct entry will be quite small, will be you know, probably you know, a, a very small percentage of the total number uh, of police officers. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, the effect will be probably less dramatic than those who, who hope it will transform everything and those who but feel it But it only takes one catastrophe, doesn't but, it? But, but the main point, the, the way I think to put this in context, is that what I want to see, I have huge ambitions. Uh, I want the, uh, the police service to be a natural point of entry, a natural place to go for a large chunk of the brightest and best in our country. You know, the, the people who traditionally have thought, I'm going to go into medicine or all, all the professions uh, you mentioned, I want the police to be up there with that. And now direct entry will play a part in that. As I say, it will be a small percentage. But I think, it, and it does involve a mindset change of saying we want absolutely some of, you know, a chunk of the most talented people at every generation in this country to regard the police as a natural career for them. But they could do that by starting at the bottom. But 
one observes that that hasn't happened in the past. So that's, that's another change that has to come, that it hasn't happened often enough. There are clearly you know, some, some of the brightest and best, some of them sitting on this table uh, around me uh, who, who joined the police 20, 30 years ago. But not enough of them. It wasn't, it wasn't enough of a natural choice for enough of the brightest and best people. And, and you know, Hugh and I in particular will, will know that about, about their friends. You know, when, 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 when you were you know, in your teens and 20s, probably not enough of your friends followed your example and said, right, this is what I want to do. So we haven't got the brightest and the best in the police service? Well, I'd just say look around this room. No more than that. There's some fantastic people at every single rank in the service. Fully yeah, accept, some, but not enough. I that, fully accept we're saying. not good enough at bringing people through quickly enough. And I, I had an interesting conversation yesterday with the chief officer um, about the high potential development scheme, where the average length of service for people going on to HPDS is now nine years. When I was on the special course, if you had five years in, you were, you were old. Uh, and old in terms of service, not in terms of old. Um, but, but, but the real issue is, the, for some reason, the, the chief officers of today, who were the ones who jumped from superintendent to chief officer, who, who jumped from um, PC to inspector within sort of three, four years, for some reason, they're not doing the same to the people that are in the service now. We're not bringing through the talent of the really talented people. I believe they are out there. I just don't think we've got a proper structured talent management program that is bringing people through to the highest level. OK. Do you want to come back on anything that's been said on the front? Okay, the mic, fine. Well, uh, if you've got something to say, you can get it back. But anyway. I was just going to say, I did a survey recently. 64% of superintending ranks have a degree or higher. Um, so it's not about academic qualifications. And as Irene says, it's not about lack of talent. It is there. Um, it just, I think most of us would support rapid progression but direct entry is completely something oh. different. Okay, gentlemen here, uh, stand up if you would, sir, and uh, tell us uh, who you yeah, are and David what you're doing. from the Metropolitan Police. I was privileged to hold a regular commission uh, in the army, and five years ago, we had a significantly higher proportion of our PCs entering with degrees than the army did through Sandhurst. <laughs> Damien? Good, good. I'm glad we're moving in that direction. Uh, and, and the more we do it, the better. That, that's all I'm saying. I want it, it to be a completely natural choice when, as I say, the brightest and the best people are considering a career choice. It should be much more popular than it has been in the past for them to consider But the you're police. saying there's no shortage of people coming forward? You said earlier... I'm, I'm, well, I'm, no, no, what I'm saying, it's, it's an ambition that, that, that I think to say that people, yeah, the same number of people consider the police along with the law, medicine, those, those sorts of professions. Uh, it, it, we're still not there, and we need to do more about it. And, and I think that, that's what I'm doing, is trying to put the, the direct entry debate in the context of, of a wider um, upskilling, uh, which you know, I want to see the service operate to make it even better in the future. All right. Can uh, I just say, John, yes, I don't think it's about degrees. It's got nothing to do with degrees and academic qualifi qualifications, especially in, in a... Mm. A, situ a society where we're making it more and more difficult and expensive for people to go to university in the first place. It's about the brightest and the best, as Damon says. It's about bringing people in from, from with other skills and, uh, and other experiences who can do similar jobs. I mean, I know an awful lot of journalists who would make bloody good detectives. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot be bloody awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, we'll move on. Uh, is Peter... Is Peter Holden with us? I, th I suspect he may have had to go. Uh, no, Peter Holden. Oh, Peter Holden is there. Right. We can get a microphone to Peter Holden. Thank you very much. He's from the British Transport Police. Uh, and this is on something we touched on briefly earlier, but it's well worth pursuing it in greater detail. That's the UK policing structure. Uh, your question, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, the dominant theme of conference has been that the current UK policing structure is no longer fit for purpose for policing in the 21st century. Uh, it's a two-part question. I was going to ask the panel for their views on that statement and uh, their thoughts on what a potential future structure might look like. Uh, and I'm pretty clear now on some panel members' views. Uh, so I'd be very interested to see if there's any panel members who support the maintenance of the status quo in particular. And the second part, which is really addressed to the Minister, 
We heard the Home Secretary yesterday, uh, it seems to favour collaboration rather than amalgamation. And my question is, how much is the government's appetite for structural change inhibited because of the potential impact on previous reforms, such as the uh, PCCs? Okay, thank you very much. Well, let me kick off with Sean, because you touched on this earlier, and you made your views fairly plain. Uh, elaborate on that, if you would, why you think that the current system just simply doesn't work and what we might uh, do in the future to make it better. Well, I think that the, the main issue is, I think you know where I stand. It's, the structure is not fit for purpose. It needs to be reformed. We need to have many fewer forces, because that's the, the most efficient and also the most intelligent way to, to go forward with policing. The problem, the dilemma the government has created, uh, as, as Peter indicates, is that it, it's pulling in two different directions. Everybody with a brain knows we need fewer police forces, we need to change the structure, but we've created a governance structure that is pulling in exactly the opposite direction with 43 or 42 PCCs who are operating in completely different ways and, and, and coming up with different ideas and, and absolutely creating, actually sort of fragmenting the structure even further at a time when it needs to move in the other direction. It's almost like we're pulling in two completely different directions at the moment. And I think you have to probably do away with PCCs. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of like the democratic accountability idea I, I don't think the structure we've created for governance. All right. Let's come to PCCs works. in just a tick. But first of all, so you deal with the basic question about the number of forces we've got at the moment and, and the allegation, at least by Sean, that simply doesn't work. We could uh, cut that number down quite dramatically. Well, I, this isn't a, a sort of party political point because of the last government, I used to have this uh, discussion of the last government too, there was no, no appetite for uh, an overarching reform of the policing structure. Um, but I, do, I think it's becoming inevitable. If I look at the Scottish model, for example, uh, they've gone from eight forces uh, to one. And I think why that's quite helpful is, is now that we can have a model we can look at and see how that develops. The governance structure is completely different, I have to say, which, which leads on to the point Sean already made. And the points I'd make is, one, I think, in terms of maximising efficiency uh, and reflecting you know, Sean's desire for us to learn from the private sector, it's one of the first things you do when you're facing a budget cut, budget cut is to minimise the impact on the front end by reorganising uh, the structure to be at its absolute uh, most efficient. So I think that's um, point one. I think the, the public have an absolute right to be reassured around the local policing element. Um, you know, in Northern Ireland, we were the biggest uh, policing territory. We were 5,500 square miles, and we reduced our command structure radically from about 26 individual command units to about six, uh, seven or eight. Um, and part of that program was very much through public engagement to reassure that local policing would still remain the core of our policing model and, that, and a, a clearly identifiable local leader, police leader, would be available to them. So, so there's, there's a number of things I think we can do to minimise some of the concerns. On governance, well, <coughs> firstly, that's a matter for government, not for us. Um, but I, I think one could imagine a number of structures which certainly didn't take away the democratic element, um, but maybe a broader panel of elected players covering a wider um, geography. I, I don't think that's necessarily um, a block. Uh, I think if there was a willingness to do it, it should not be done by the police. There is some learning from history here. It's too important uh, to be decided by the police. And I think it's something about what is that least worst fit around the number of forces to deliver the local through the national into the international um, without becoming, you know, being seen as so big, i.e. a national structure, I think would be probably um, a step too far. Collaboration, by definition, is suboptimal, and if the cuts continue, um, you know, I think that will be a question for government around why aren't you doing this, because collaboration, well, at the moment, it's taken a bit of a step back as PCCs work out, you know, understandably, what collaborative arrangements they are in, if they're working for their part of uh, the country or not, and where they want to flex it. So there's lots of work going on, but the effort I see as I travel the country to get some pretty minimalist collaborative arrangements in place at huge cost in terms of you know, just the time and the organisation suggests to me it would be easier. In Northern Ireland, if I said this happens, it happens because I was the only chief you know, covering that bit of territory. It does make it easier. Steve? I mean, isn't it a bit odd that you've got 43, 44 different forces or whatever it is, uh, you know, having different policies about procurement, different technology, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. when, you know, you're all fighting the same battle and, and a great deal of money could be saved if they're if they amal amal amalgamated and cooperated more than they do now. Absolutely, John. And uh, for me, 43 forces is not sustainable in these austere times. It, it needs to be looked at. Ultimately, it's a political decision. 
I think our political leaders need to make some brave decisions. Uh, and I think the structure uh, and the makeup of 43 forces has to change. What about PCCs? They'll have something to say about it. Obviously, there'll be vested interest about what the PCCs uh, and their sort of uh, thiefdoms, if you like, uh, and want to hold on to that. But the holistic, uh, you, you made mention of procurement, consistency, if you, you get dealt with in one particular way in one force and then you move to another force, you might be dealt with differently. And all those sorts of issues could be addressed, I think, by looking at the structure of the service. And 43 forces is just not sustainable going forward. What's the, your organisation? organisation's uh, response to this, Harry? Uh, well, as people know from, from my speech yesterday, I, I think this is at the heart of, of the future CSR. I think to move into the 2015 six CSR without any sort of plan to restructure is just going to put forces under, under pressure to the extent that we'll lose key elements of policing like neighbourhood policing in the future. If, if we're going to go down this route, I wouldn't support um, a development of mergers or amalgamations because all you'll do is start creating smaller, well, sort of larger, but still fairly small um, forces. So you might reduce from 43 to, uh, say, 33, but actually you're not changing the nature of policing. I just think it needs a clean sheet of paper It'll eliminate any accusations about one force taking over another force. It'll eliminate all the discussions about whose cap badge do we keep or what do we call our force. And it should start from the bottom up. It should start with local neighbourhood areas built up into BCUs that are coterminous with local authorities. And that should be the foundation for building up uh, forces that are built on that on that principle yeah. with, with layers of, of uh, policing resources built above that. Damien, uh, Peter's uh, contention is that the, the current system isn't, isn't fit for purpose. What's your view? I think that the key to this debate is, is to pick up the, the last point Irene made about building up from the bottom, because there's a danger that it becomes completely binary, that either a government, any government says, right, we're going to have any number between 43 and 1, um, and yeah, we'll build it around the big cities or whatever, however you do it, uh, and that's what we're going to do, and we're going to pass legislation, or you have the current system. And actually, uh, I, I think... Well, about the, about the first one, that's precisely what uh, the previous government tried to do, and even with uh, a huge majority in Parliament, couldn't get it through the House of Commons. So it's understandable that there's not an appetite uh, to go around that route again, because you know, we tried and failed, if you like, we sort of politicians uh, generally. And yeah, people have slightly dismissively referred to a sort of attachment to the cap badge. I think you find that's quite a big attachment uh, when you actually tell people you're going to take it away, not, not just people inside uh, the, the police service, but actually people outside it's as well. It's also important for local people to know who their force is, uh, where they are, and, and who they are. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and in different parts of the country, I accept you, you get different levels of emotional resonance. Mm -hmm. You know, people, people who live in Kent, my part of the world, know that they live in Kent and are proud to live in Kent and like having Kent police. Um, I mean, to pick a, a big force, in particular the Thames Valley. Nobody, nobody says they live in the Thames Valley. You know, people live in Berkshire or Oxfordshire, uh, and they may well feel attachment to that. So I, I ex this is why I think it's, it's, it's more complex than just saying we've got to do this or we've got to stick with what we've got. And, and, and again, collaboration has been sort of slightly dismissed. Um, I don't think we're anything near the end of the journey of the benefits we can get from collaboration. And you don't have to go very far to see that because we're in one of the areas where there has been uh, the most creative. And, and I, I'm struck, having met this morning with, with uh, the Chief Constable and the PCC uh, for Warwickshire, that they talk about an alliance. They don't talk about collaboration with West Mercia. They say it's an alliance. It's, it, it, although they are still two forces, they are working as one. Uh, that has provided a much better uh, policing model for people in, in the four counties that make up uh, Warwickshire and West Mercia. And so actually, it's, it, it, it touches back on the first point that, that Irene made uh, about it, it coming from the bottom up. I think you will get, uh, if people come to government with proposals that say, uh, we are going to do this, uh, and we've got local consent, and it's properly grounded um, in local communities, then we're not going to sit there and say, no, you, you can't do that. But it's got to come from the bottom up. We, you know, we, we, we think if we try to impose it from the top down, we or any government try to impose it from the top down, experience tells us it fails. What about the second part of Peter's co uh, question, which was uh, along the lines of whatever you do, and even if you do nothing, what about the future of PCCs? 
the future PCCs is, uh, I, I think, yeah, once you have set in train a desirable democratic change. Uh, How democratic you, you, was it? Was you a change that actually had only uh, one in eight people voting? Well, yeah, there are lots of local council by-elections that, that elect people with low, and of course we'd have wanted uh, a, a higher turnout. But they're there now, and you know, inevitably they're doing the job uh, 41 different ways, uh, 42 if you include London, and some of them have made more impact uh, on the public than others. But most of them are making a difference. One of, one of the things that has happened over the past year, it seems to be unarguable, is that interest in police governance has increased hugely among the public. They now they know there's someone there. They may, are they really? They may vaguely know. Oh, yeah. I you mean, think if I went out in the streets of, of near the big city of Birmingham today and I said, <laughs> what's a PCC? Most people will know what a PCC is. I suggest to you they wouldn't. Well, I think a lot more would, actually, than, than voted in the election. And, but it's, and it's, I agree, it's different in different parts of the country. Yeah. Some of them have made it their job in their first year in office to make themselves um, a big local figure, you know, for good or ill. Some have, some have made themselves big local figures by taking decisions which have, may not have been very clever. Um, but, but one way or another, I think PCCs are now part of the landscape. Mm -hmm. And also, as I say, once you've got a measurable level of democratic accountability it's a pretty perverse step to say, no, we don't want that. Let's, let's move back to something that absolutely, I can guarantee you, if you went around the streets of Birmingham and asked, and asked three years ago, who's the chair of the police authority, absolutely well, nobody would have known fair that. Fair point. Sean, may you want to come in? I think it's the same bloke, isn't it? It's always it been Bob Jones. It is. Isn't it? Well, and, I, I have the same in Kent. It's, it's always, it's, yes, quite. And, and, and Barnes in Kent. Uh, I, I obviously know Kent better than I know Birmingham. Absolutely nobody had heard of Anne uh, three years ago. And pretty much everyone in Kent has heard of Anne now. Well, not always for the right reasons, yeah. Sean? I think um, you're right. There's a, a higher level of interest in, uh, in police governance, but it's only because some of the PCCs have been behaving like idiots, you know, appointing their best friends and, and, and the guy in Cumbria who's just gone completely mad, you know. Um, I, I, I think it is... The system has to take time to bed down. Um, but, but what worries me is, is long-term is this idea that we're going to have... 43 different models of policing when I think we need a much more unified and thought through and, 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 and different structure. I'll let you answer the writ from the guy in Cumbria. But uh, can we go back to uh, Peter? Do you have any comment on what's been said, Peter? Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, commend the Minister on a spirited response, which I'd expect from a Pembroke man. Um, but I remain unconvinced and I think... Um, so Hugh made some very good points, particularly around collaboration and the effort that goes in to set up these ad hoc arrangements. And, and I really think um, that there's, this is a time for change. Um, and I heard the spirited response, but I, I really think that if we're looking to reform, we've got to be brave and we've got to grasp the nettle. OK, thank you very much indeed, Peter. I'm going to move on now to Jack Atwell. Jack, around? Could you, uh, Jack, there you are. Uh, Jack's from Derbyshire, and Jack's uh, uh, question is about BM BME officers at uh, senior levels, black minority uh, and ethnic officers at senior level. Thank you. Uh, my question is, before we ask for a change in the law that would uh, make positive discrimination lawful, should we not be inspecting forces and see what they're actually doing to comply with the current positive duty under the Equality Act? For example, nearly 50% of the total superintendents, uh, BME superintendents, um, in England and Wales are just spread between two forces, that being the Met and Derbyshire. Some forces are clearly doing different things and trying positive action, and do other forces need to look elsewhere before we ask for changes of, in the law? To you? Uh, well, I know College of Policing is doing a huge amount on this, and in particular looking at how we progress the brightest and the best Druva system. Um, I had some very interesting meetings with uh, colleagues from the BPA on this and looking at some radical ideas, which I know have gone into the college. And that may include such stuff as, you know, do we need a, a, almost a fast-track process for BME colleagues to, to actually manage that and speed it up because the service has failed? I, I think we need to be clear on this. We have not been as successful as we should have been uh, in, in having a, a workforce that represents the people we protect. Why is that, do you think? I think there's a, a number of very complex reasons um, around it which uh, take some analysis. But if one goes to my experience in, in Northern Ireland, you know, I was given a legal uh, position which enabled me to create a, a police service that was far more 
proportionate to the community we, we policed over a, a seven-year period. It was called 50-50 recruiting. And what we, but by the time I was leaving, what we were seeing is those officers, you know, colleagues from the uh, broadly Catholic community being pr progressed through the ranks and actually balancing uh, a different diversity issue, but a very important one uh, in terms of public confidence, uh, through a legal process. It's a blunt instrument, um, and it was prima facie unlawful if it was going to run on forever, and it's now ended. But it gave me what I see as an absolutely critical tool to bring a service into a, you know, to, to give the confidence to the community that we were absolutely determined to protect them through a balanced workforce that colleagues here do not have. So I do think, you know, we may be at that stage of, of whilst we can learn from each other, we've been doing that for a lot of time. There's a lot of effort, huge amount of encouragement from chief officers around mentoring individuals. Um, uh, the college only recently asked for mentors. They were, they were flooded with senior officers saying, we are more than happy to engage in that. But frankly, you know, we have not succeeded. Direct entry, and it may, it, it's a minimal, it's, it'll be a very minor part of that. It may have some impact, but it's not, it's going to take too long if we don't do something really focused and really radical. Steve? Uh, I don't think this is just an issue for uh, BM, BM uh, East superintendents. This is uh, an issue for the service. I don't think we uh, are reflective of the demographics within the country. It's also true of the, uh, the police federation, and I think a lot more can be done. Uh, only yesterday, uh, there was a launch in Birmingham uh, by the Federation under the heading of Make It Count uh, with a view to actively encouraging people to come forward from unrepresented groups to become part of the Federation and I think there is an awful lot that can be done. And why do you think we've failed so far? I don't think we've gone about it in the, in, in the right fashion and I like the idea of the mentoring which is a, a, you know, a very positive step and I think that we've got to do a lot more within the organisation. Irene? I think there's been lots of good intent over the years but as, as Hugh says, it's just not developed the results. And I don't think we've been very good at actually evaluating what we've been doing and how effective uh, it, or otherwise it's been. I, I still firmly believe the biggest issue for the service is um, that we don't value difference. We don't value people who are different as much as we value people who are like us. And the reason we do that is because all of us have an unconscious bias. I have it, you have it. We all have an unconscious bias that affects the way we look at people. And I'm, and I'm not just talking BME, female, LGBT. I'm actually talking white men who are different, who, who actually have a different approach to the way they do their job as leaders or whatever. Uh, and, and I just think that I've been talking to the college about this. I've been talking to the Home Office about this. I think unconscious bias is something that is addressed in other organisations to try and help deal with these issues. And it's something that's never, ever been discussed in policing. Uh, and I'm really pushing the college to start looking into how we can actually address issues of unconscious bias, particularly around recruitment and selection. Things like mentoring and coaching, that's been going on for years. We've had all the positive action programs that we've had for years. It's still not delivering results. Sure. So we need to do something different. Is the, is the force guilty of unconscious bias, in your view? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's inevitable. I mean, you, you look around this room and you can see that policing is too male and too white. Um, I, I was born and brought up in Northern Ireland and um, my experience of policing as, as a youngster was that the police were, as a Catholic, they were people we had no confidence in. We didn't report anything to them. We didn't go near them. They weren't, they didn't police us. And uh, Hugh Ward's greatest contribution to public life is to oversee the reform of policing in Northern Ireland. It has been transformed by radical action from the top to ensure that recruitment is fair and even, and the police are representative of, of, of that, of the province. Um, I think particularly in London that is an acute problem now. The Met is not representative of the people it polices and we can... But it's one of the best performers according to the evidence. We, but we can tinker around the edges with this. It, it, it's, it, it, we really do need some radical action about recruitment, it, particularly in London and in our big cities. Damon Green, um, do, you, do you sort of smell unconscious bias within the police service of England and Wales? It's possible. I mean, Irene, Irene would would know from the inside better than I do, but, but she makes, a, I think, a very powerful case on this. I, I'm going to talk about diversity in a speech I'm doing in the next session, so uh, I won't go on too long. I think the one, the only thing we haven't mentioned is people coming forward to try and join in the first place. I think you know, the, the, the first step you need to take is that every community in this country uh, feels comfortable with members of that community joining the police. And Sadly, that may not be the case, yeah. uh, and I think you know, we all know that. So one of the th actions that you know, both politicians and the, the police themselves can take is, is to strip away 
those things that appear to make them unwelcoming in the way that you know, policing in Northern Ireland appeared unwelcoming to one of the communities there. And, and that's one of the reasons, it's not the central reason, but one of the reasons why uh, we're reviewing stop and search and how it's used. Stop and search is an extremely useful tool, but if it, if it appears to be being used unfairly, then that in itself will, will change the view of the police of groups of people in society. So the last thing they'll ever think of doing is becoming police officers. Yeah, that's now, the, that's, we've, the, we've got to that's the huge challenge, isn't it? I mean, yeah. making the police service uh, of this country somewhere that people, uh, be it what we're calling BME people, uh, feel comfortable at approaching and, and not having any resentment from within their own community for doing so. I mean, but Sean is absolutely right. You know, with no disrespect to anybody, just look around this room, and we're looking at almost exclusively male, white, uh, and female white faces, and majority of them male, white faces. Uh, and they are representative of thousands of others. And that does not reflect the society in which we live. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's Point made. Impossible to argue with, yeah. yeah. As I said, I'm going to talk about it in about five minutes. Okay, so. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't want to spoil your speech. Okay. Uh, Jack, do you want to come back on what's been said? Um, no, I, I feel at the moment, personally, I, I wouldn't want the change in law. I think there's a lot more to be done there. Uh, but I do hear the debates around mentoring over the years. I've been mentored. I sit as a chief superintendent. I believe I've got a chief constable who actually is prepared to make brave decisions, take risks, and innovate and create, be creative. I, th I think the thing is, give the, a change in the law, sometimes it can be seen as a cop -out. I get the Northern Ireland experience. I get the America mm -hmm. experience. But I also think we're in a very different area to why those changes were done there. Quick word from to you. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not advocating a, a change in law here. I'm, I'm just explaining how it worked. And the other learning we got from that um, radical proposal was one was it was subject to fierce legal challenge. So we had to absolutely stand up and defend it right up into the European courts. But it, the central it gave, it's, it's, it's the minister's point, it gave people felt they had, they had not had permission, they would get a fair crack at getting in. And therefore, the, the people from communities felt that it was worth it this time, because they certainly would get uh, a fair cut. Of course, we, I didn't recruit my own people. You know, it was done by, it was outsourced to a private company. We set the standards, so we put all sorts of mechanisms in. I, I don't think that's necessarily what we need to do here, but it's just something to reflect on, and, and that may encourage us to think more radically about what we can do without legislation. Okay, Emma Weber uh, from Devon and Cornwall. Could you identify yourself, please? Um, oh, she's on right in front of me. Sorry, Emma. Uh, Emma is going to talk about something we've touched on in this conference so far, and that's the issue of mental health and the police role therein. Thank you, uh, John. Um, we've heard quite a bit about um, police resources being stretched to the limit, and a significant amount of police time is taken up with dealing with people with mental illness, often in a police station custody environment. Um, what can be done to ensure that other agencies are made to play their part in providing suitable alternative places of safety or assessment centres to reduce demand on our currently stretched police resources? Um, in, in that way, you know, we can provide a far better service to those vulnerable members of the public. Steve, how big a strain on the service is this? It's a huge strain. Um, we have feedback all the time. In fact, there was a motion to, to our conference in May in and around this particular issue about the amount of time that officers are spending dealing with people with mental health issues and uh, having to accommodate them in, in police cells because there's nowhere else for them to go. But uh, for me, this is all about um, working together. It was the theme of our conference, uh, 2020 vision, working together. And, I, and I'm not saying because the minister is sat next to me, but uh, we've had uh, many a conversation, and I also had a conversation with the Home Secretary on Monday about trying to address this issue. We, as an organisation, are trying to gather some evidence, hard evidence, of what is going on up and down the, uh, the country, and I get the sense of almost pushing against an open door in relation to that uh, relationship with, with government, who really do want to address it, as we, of course, want to do as well. Okay. Um, so you? Yeah, I, I just... It, no difference to really what Steve said. The Home Secretary has certainly taken a personal interest in this and is certainly driving change and getting other um, departments to take their responsibility far more seriously than perhaps they have done in the past. But and so for me, and the stark reality remains, this service is the service of last resort. So whatever change we put in to minimise the impact, the reality is our officers will be responding to people who are vulnerable and do need our help and support. It seems to me the important bit is how quickly we then get them into the right people places so the risk is not borne by the service, which is ill-equipped. Uh, understandably, it's not our prime role to keep people who are clearly in need of medical uh, attention, not criminal intervention or not police intervention, um, to keep them safe. And that's certainly where the history of this has fallen down, getting uh, the right departments to take responsibility you know, post the immediate bit, which I don't think we will... 
uh, change. Uh, chiefs are very, very attuned to this and are doing an awful lot locally to try and you know, get those partnership arrangements in place. And it struck me as quite strange. If one looks at the risk the officers carry on these, the most vulnerable people in our society, by definition, are higher risk. But a couple of years ago, I, I live in Sussex, um, I happened to come across a guy who was not at all well, so did a number of other citizens. They called the ambulance, they also called the police. Um, an ambulance turned up, the police turned up, this guy was clearly not well, he was potentially, um, uh, could have passed away, so the officer got involved. Uh, it just struck me, in all that, and it was done incredibly professionally by all services, had that poor man died, he didn't actually, that would have been a death in custody, technically. And all that bureaucracy comes in, and the figures, because that man, we had had a contact with this individual in a completely innocent and professional way, it adds to the figures. So when you get these stark figures released by the press that X number of people died in custody, not distilled out, all those figures are in it. And I do think we need to be a bit braver about some of this stuff and have some conversations with IPCC and others around getting, you know, managing those sorts of add-ons that happen when we're dealing with mental health. Damien Green, what can you and or Jeremy Hunt uh, promise Emma? Um, we... I mean, just as, I mean, Steve is right when he says he's pushing an open door with, with, with Home Office Ministers, and we are pushing at the door uh, of the Health Department, and from Jeremy Hunt downwards, they get the point, particularly Norman Lamb, who's the, the Mental Health Minister, because it, I expostulate to him that really I don't think it's a good use of police officer time or skills to have people with mental health problems in the back of a van, well, still less in, 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 in a police cell. Or yeah. a police, and, and he says, yeah, absolutely, nor do I want mental health, health patients not getting medical treatment but being stuck in police cells. So there is a community of interest. It, so what's happening is, it's a, it's, it's, is you know, clearly the valid question. Um, we have started... Uh, introducing places of safety where they weren't there before. The one in North Yorkshire opens next month. And incidentally, people who say, what do PCCs do? It was, the, it was the newly elected PCC. The first thing, she came to ministers and banged it on the table and said, look, it's ridiculous. This is a huge county, not a single place of safety for mental health patients. It's opening in October. Uh, there'll be two more uh, following uh, between now and next April, but, but, but more to come. Uh, we've now got... Uh, a pilot of mental health nurses going out uh, on patrol, effectively, uh, so that they can do some triaging out there uh, on the streets, and, and we're extending that uh, so that you know, we can get initial diagnosis right. And, but this, I'm conscious, the, these are the first steps. Are you reassured by that, Emma? Um, partly, but um, it all seems to be taking a long time. I mean, it probably was 12 months ago or whenever the minister first um, came into his role, I recall being told this was a priority. Um, and it just t seems to be taking a long time to roll anything out, and yet the, our resources are getting stretched more and more. Why is it taking so long, Jeremy? Well, a bit, partly because it's... It, it, it's not my levers I'm pulling, it's, it's, the, it's the health service uh, mm -hmm. levers, uh, and so... Uh, we have to make the case. But, and also, I think there, there is, I mean, it's a point Steve made uh, uh, about evidence. There's a huge amount uh, of very compelling anecdote, and, and, and you will all know from your daily lives, uh, that this is reflecting the underlying truth. It has been quite difficult to get at the hard evidence that says, right, this is actually what we need to do, and this is where uh, we need, where there are obvious gaps like places of safety uh, that aren't available, we're putting them in. And as I say, the first one comes next month. Irene? I think there's one thing we have to remember uh, is that, that we do have a responsibility to look after people who are mentally ill in a public place. We, we have a responsibility to go and see them, whether the people are uh, threatening suicide, whatever it might be. Um, but there comes that point of transferability, and I think that's, that's the issue for me, is um, that up to a point we've got responsibility, but it's about getting the health service to, to sort of step up to the plate in terms of theirs. I agree the role of PCCs is critical in this. What I will say is it frustrates me that in some forces they've really got this sorted. We've got a colleague here from Merseyside mm -hmm. who, who has achieved some fantastic work in Merseyside. Merseyside no longer hold anybody as a place of safety in police cells. And they've done that through working in partnership with local authority, well, sorry, with the local health authorities. The, uh, they've got suites in the accident emergency department that will take people if there are no beds in mental health units. This can be done with a bit of effort. A lot of that effort has to happen locally, and I accept that. Um, but I do think PCCs are crucial in this role, and there are a number of PCCs around the county, who are uh, around the country, who are really taking this seriously and making a difference. Okay, thank you very much, Dean Emma. Nora Holford is in the room, I think. Nora, could you? There you are, uh, from Thames Valley Police, with a question about diversity and the media. Stand by, Sean. Um, my question for you is: How can we improve the openness of the service when the media do not report key cases? And I'll give you an example. 
very shortly after the tragic murder of drummer Lee Rigby, the wife of a member of the British Army was murdered. This was a sexually motivated crime, a stranger rape and murder. Most of you will be completely unfamiliar with the case. It was hardly reported. My question to you is why? And there's one point I would like to make the panel aware of. The soldier was a Gurkha and his wife was from Nepal. But the incident happened here? It happened here, in, in Berkshire. UK. Thank you. Sean? Uh, you're right, I'm completely unfamiliar with the case. And I think shortly after Lee Rigby's murder, there was also uh, the murder of the elderly Muslim man in Birmingham, which really went uh, seriously underreported as well. Um, the, the media is very, very, very far from perfect. We, we are uh, select cases or, or cases leap out at us on, on all sorts of different levels, but they tend to have uh, they, they tend to have visual reasons. There has to be footage or pictures. I mean, the, the, the Lee Rigby murder in particular was, was an extraordinary story because of the behaviour of the murderers. They, they made it a very public act. They wanted to be filmed uh, on, on, and all the rest of it. But, yeah, I think there is probably an unconscious institutional racist bias in the media as well. I'm afraid newsrooms are as white and as male as this room is, and, and it's a huge problem. Well, that's a very honest answer. I was going to say to you that I, mean, I was in Fleet Street even before you, long before you actually, in the 1970s, when I worked for what you, you say it's sort of institutionalised and, uh, and, and kept on the, under the surface, or implying it's kept under the surface. I worked for news editors, one particular news editor in Fleet Street, who was unashamedly racially prejudiced and would not tolerate for that newspaper any story of any kind uh, about someone of black or ethnic origin. Well, I, I had that experience in, in the 90s as well. People blatantly and openly used racist language, and it, it, it's only in the last four or five years, I would say, has that kind of thing disappeared from newsrooms. Yeah. Uh, Steve, comment on that? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the media will run with the stories that they want to, 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 to run with. Um, I mean, uh, as an organisation, we have received quite some... Uh, serious criticism about why aren't you on telly more, why aren't you in the papers more, and I, I think that that is uh, potentially a two-way process. I mean, under the current uh, climate, I think there's a reluctance from police officers to speak to the media. I don't want to, Sean will, uh, will back me up on that, but there's almost a fear factor of engaging with the media as to what the outcomes of that might be for individual officers up and down the country, and we experience that really on a, on a regular daily Post basis. Levison. Well, Post yeah, uh, with what's going on around the country, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. Certainly I'll say it for you. Yeah, yeah, All right. Okay. Um, Damien? Um, I, can I just point out, I'm not responsible for how the media reports no. uh, crime. It's a sigh of relief. Um, the, I, I think I, I, I you know, frankly recognise Sean's uh, characterisation uh, of, of some of the national media. The only, the only point I'd make um, is that there's often a huge difference between national and local media in this, and, and it's very directly relevant because uh, in, in my largely peaceful uh, constituency, there was a murder a couple of years back of uh, a Nepali man. Uh, I've, I've got a huge ex Gurkha community in my constituency, um, and there were real shockwaves for months afterwards, and, and it was one of those, because it was such a prominent and, and so... Uh, well reported locally, um, it did actually induce quite a lot of cross-community activity and support uh, that was actually started by, by the, the shock and horror uh, at this murder. So I think, you know, sometimes with all the pressures on them, the national media do do all the things Sean has admitted, but at, at local level it's often not like that. Why do you, Norma, uh, sorry, Nora, uh, think this this impacts on the openness of the service. Could you just explain that a little more? Yeah, the reason I raised <coughs> it is that the family liaison officers in this particular place in the SAO really struggled to explain to the family and the local Nepalese mm. community why on earth we couldn't even get our local media to pay it much attention, mm -hmm. let alone the national media. I mean, this particular case came off that this particular lady went, went walking in the evening and got reported missing. She didn't return from her walk. So we originally publicised it as a missing person, high-risk missing person, put out the photos. Within 12 hours, we found the body, and it went on from there. So it, it's one of those stories that normally it runs. Normally, as an SIO, you expect mm. to get a media scrum, and it didn't happen. Mm. And we, we, we really struggled to get the confidence of the Nepalese community because... They felt, well, 
you're hiding something. You, you, that, why is the media not there? And presumably impacted on your ability to get witnesses and people to come forward. Mm. If yeah, there's no I mean, publicity we, we, about it, people wouldn't know. We were quite lucky that it, it was a, a rural community, but we had to do the legwork. We can had to can I ask you, what, what did your press office do? What was their strategy around that? Their strategy was to put the, the usual things. We, we put, put media releases out, we put tapes out, we put did photos any, out. Did anybody pick up a telephone and ring a journalist and say, this is a really important story? Um, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. But we certainly had a media strategy in place because we, we wanted to make sure that, you know, any of the people that were in the area that we couldn't pick up for our usual trolls that we, we actually got those witnesses. With, with the Birmingham issue, and because that was following, you know, the, the guys charged now with the murder and, and the, the bombings in, uh, at the mosques, and um, Chris Sims actually, the, the chief constable up there, rang me up and said, why is this not a story? Well, we're puzzling why this isn't big. And, and one of my answers to him was, your press office isn't selling the story. They're not joining the dots. They're refusing to confirm things and, and they're just not being proactive about putting the story out there. Now there is definitely a post Levison, post phone hacking caution and fear around talking to journalists, but we have to get over that. You know, some, th some things are just more important and having a media strategy and, and actually being proactive and picking up a telephone and talking to journalists is the best way to do it. And We've got another, another contribution alongside you, Nora, if you don't mind. I'm going to sure. running out of time. Uh, yes, sir, tell us your, yeah, own, your yeah, point. Yeah. Is. Mark Payne from West Midlands. Um, I ran that job, Sean. Um, that was the, the murder of the man and the, and the put bombings. Um, and what, you know, the, the, the reality of that was we got a, a Muslim chap uh, murdered Bombs placed outside three mosques, viable devices that, that went off. Um, you know, we were having to deal with the Muslim community who were saying, why on earth, you know, when you've got all the publishers around Lee Rigby, are, are the national media not picking up? Um, you know, I, I was in the press office. Uh, you know, they were making phone calls. Um, I was there when they were making them. Um, it, it, we just could not get the media to pick up on that story. Well, I, I can really tell you, Mark, we had, on the Sunday when, when the story, I think maybe the first bomb, we had a Muslim <coughs> reporter trying to say, Do you, are you treating this as like an Islamophobic hate crime? And your press office wouldn't confirm it. So he was, like, he was the most open door you were ever going to get on that story, and you, nobody would tell him what yeah, was really okay. going on. Okay, well, I, I, you know, th there's, there's obviously learning. We're, we're trying to do a bit of learning out of it, but I, I do think, you know, in terms of, you know, the, all, all the people on, on the panel, the media, the, the government, the, these are real issues for our communities that's damaging, you know, the, the, the Muslim community's uh, confidence in the police and the other, and the government agencies and the media has been really damaged. And, and I just think we need to find a way behind it. I, I think Leveson's had a huge impact, um, you know, and, and has damaged those relations. Okay. But actually on the ground, it was, it was really difficult. We're going to take one more quick question from Alan Lees from West Yorkshire. Alan, where are you? There he is on the front. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I want a very quick response from each of our panellists because Sir Hugh has to leave in, in less than five minutes' time. Um, but we still have more to do, but Sir Hugh will be leaving us then. Ali, your question. Uh, it's 50 years since Martin Luther King had his dream. What is your wildest dream for policing? Um, Steve. Um, double the pain pensions for all superintendents. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, in, in all seriousness, uh, I, uh, I, I disagree. I do, uh, with uh, the comment made by Sir Hugh earlier in relation to the Royal Commission, I think it's long overdue in relation to criminal justice, and uh, it would be my wish that we would have a Royal Commission. Uh, I, I think that um, policing has become almost like football. Everybody thinks they know how it should be played, and we tinker around the edges, and I think a Royal Commission would nail it on taking the, uh, the police service forward. Sir Hugh? Um, Mark Stanley, of course, I should declare an interest, I guess, that um, I think it's something around ACPO remaining as a critical part of the national infrastructure so we can keep people safe from national threats. Irene? Uh, I think mine would be, it's more of a fantasy reel than a dream, uh, is that when, when I retire in two and a half years' time, I become an MP and get elected as Home Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Could happen. Sean? Uh, that the all too silent Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police would give me an interview. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that is a fantasy. <laughs> David. Uh, my, my wildest dream is that everyone in this country uh, has the same respect and affection for the police that most people now have, uh, and that uh, some distant future police minister uh, can do the round of police conferences without a trace of nervousness. 